get them. If you do not have one of the two-sided handouts, I want you to please, please get a copy of that. As we're going to work our way through a very simple illustration. And while, while I'm getting the, the camera and everything adjusted, what I want you to do, what I want you to do is, uh, at some somewhere on the side that has the little the little man that looks like a wait he looks like an outline in a homicide scene but <laughs> I mean it I mean it is what it is what it is <laughs> all right I mean I, I'm not I'm not much I'm not much in the way of being an artist all right but uh, but uh, He's going to serve as our illustration, and I have I have used this little guy uh, numerous times through the years, and uh, have uh, presented him even at uh, at Posh in the pulpit on at least one or two occasions. Now I sang the song that I led intentionally before this lesson, before this sermon. The song is "I Know, I Know My Name Is There." All right, I know my name is there. And that's where I want, I want you to do is I want you to turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 18. And, Rhonda, let me see your. I don't have a copy of the little man. Turn. All right, to the, to the lower left of the little man, you've got a little space. And what I want you to do is I want you in just the next 20 or 30 seconds. Give a brief account or summary of how you were saved. For example, uh, you might, uh, like for example, how old, how old were you? Jot down maybe how old you were. Or and where you, where you were. Where you were. It might be the case that you might have been sprinkled as an infant. So you might just put, I was sprinkled as an infant. Might be the case that you were 13 years old and you were at a tent revival or some type of, of revival uh, service. You could have been at a church camp. You, in other words, just, just, a little, just a little synopsis there. How old you were, where you were. You might jot down uh, if you were baptized. If you were baptized. And what, and for example, what was what was the relationship of your baptism at the time of your salvation? For example, you know, if you might have been saved in a in a tent revival or some type of revival meeting, and uh, you might have been saved on a on a Sunday, and and then maybe baptized the next week or the next month or at some time uh, in the future. Just just jot down. And by the way, I understand that it may well be the case. That you don't know if you're saved or not. Or you might know that you're not saved. And so, well, but I, just, I want you to, I want you to get it, I want it, you get it fixed in your mind. Because the Bible tells us that we can know if we are saved. You know, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, These things I have written unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God, that you might know. That you are saved. That you might know that you are saved. And so we learn from the Bible that the Bible is the source of our information concerning our salvation. We know that we are saved by the things that are written or according to what the Bible says. And so just a, just a, just a summary, just a brief summary. By now I think I've rambled on long enough that you should have it. You should have it down on, on your paper and have it firmly fixed in your mind. And I want you to turn to the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 18. By the way, if you ever hear me make reference to the gingerbread man, this is him. I've got a lot of friends at PTP and whatnot, people all over the country that, that they, they know this man, they know this little fella as the gingerbread man because that's how I presented him. Uh, at uh, polishing the pulpit. Gingerbread man sounds a whole lot better than homicide victim. 
You know, just you know, so so gingerbread man. Let the, let the gingerbread man sink into you, sink into your mind. If he was fat, he could be Ziggy, but he's not. All right. So Colossians one and verse number eighteen, speaking about Jesus, the Bible says the he there in Colossians one eighteen is a reference to Jesus. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence. That in all things he may have the preeminence. I'm going to turn this just a little bit better for those that might be watching. Watching online, they can get a better, better picture of this. So we're going to ask some very simple questions. We're, listen, we're going to make our way, we're going to make our way through about three Bible verses. And use this little illustration to, to teach us a few things about what it is and what it means and how to be saved. And so, the Bible says, He is the head of the body, the church. And so, given this illustration from Colossians 1 and verse 18, someone identify the head for me. Jesus. He's the head of the body. Now identify for me the body. The body is the what? The body is the church. He is the head of the body, the church. By the way, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 teach the same thing, almost word for word. God has given him head over all given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. Body. So Jesus is the head, and the church is the body. So, very simple question. How many heads? One. And how many bodies? One. There's one head and there's one body. There's one Christ and thus there's one... What? Church. Church. Now, open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and verse 5. Revelation, chapter 1, and verse 5. Now, look, the book of Revelation is filled with imagery and symbolism. But there are some things early on in the book that are very straightforward. In other words, before, before what's called the apocalypse begins, and that, that, that word is... A, a, a perfectly reasonable word that talks, it's not like how we use the word apocalypse, like the zombie apocalypse or a nuclear apocalypse. That's not how the Bible we would describe uh, the, the book. It's talking about things that have been, things that are revealed, great events. But early on in the book of Revelation, there's some very simple, straightforward things said by Jesus and by John, who wrote the book of Revelation. And and in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, we'll just start in verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Unto Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Now, your copy is obviously in black and white. And so you get to see, you see here on the, the, the little gingerbread man that I've illustrated, that there is, there is all through His body, and you see I've colored it red intentionally, right? What is it that is in your body... What is it that is in your body that gives your body life, but also at the same time removes the things that are impure? What is that? Blood. For example, when you breathe, your lungs put oxygen in your blood, right? And then your blood carries that oxygen all through your body. Or when you eat, that stomach puts Nutrients in your blood, and your blood carries those nutrients to every single cell in your body, right? But the interesting thing about blood is, it's got a payload when it goes out, and then it empties it. 
And then after it empties, it wasn't do? It takes up another payload of things that would harm your body. Maybe like carbon dioxide or, or some, type of, some type of impurity that, that's in your body's cells. And then it takes that, that payload and runs it through all of your organs, right? Your liver and your kidneys and, and those filter systems that are, that are in your body, right? And so, so the blood serves in two purposes, right? It gives life and removes impurities. Now I'm speaking purely in a biological sense, uh, in our own in our own bodies. And so the answer, obviously, to the question, what gives the body life and removes impurities, is blood. That's why all the way back in the Old Testament, the Bible said the life of the body is in the blood. Is in the blood. And, and it took men thousands of years. To figure that out. They killed a lot of good men by bleeding them. They thought if they, had, if they were sick, they had bad blood in them. They, and they, 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 they bled them. You know, they literally cut them open and let the bad blood run out. Even one of our presidents was killed that way after he was injured, got sick. And so we're speaking in a purely biological sense, but now in a spiritual sense. We have a head... And we have a body, right? We have a head and we have a body. And just like you have a head and you have a body and you have blood, where is your blood? Johnny, where's your blood? In it's in your body. It's in your body. Woodard, where's your blood? It's in your body. Everybody, and by the way, your blood is in your body, right? And my blood is in mine. So... Where's the blood? Where's the blood? It's in the body, right? Just like your blood's in your body, the blood of Christ is in His body. Does that make sense? There's a head, there's a body, there's blood that gives life to the body, removes the impurities. By the way, what about, what about the impurities? What might we say are the impurities in the spiritual body? Sin. The blood of Christ takes away sin. Not only does He give us life, His blood, His blood takes, away, takes away sin. So our blood is in our body. Just like Christ's blood is in His body. Now, this might be what we would call if we were using old time terminology. This is the $64,000 question. That blood, again, I don't mean to belabor the point, but I want to imprint it in your mind. That's where the blood is, right? Alright? Is, is there any blood out here? Is there any blood? Anywhere? Any blood anywhere? All of it. All of it. That's right, Jax. You're exactly right, buddy. You hang in there with me. Hang in there with me. All the blood is in the body and none of the blood is out of the body, right? Now, so it would seem to me then that it would be safe for me to say that forgiveness of sins only takes place where? In the body. If all the blood's in the body and there's nowhere to be saved outside of the body, then I've got to be in the body in order to be saved. Is that right? So let's look at our third verse. Galatians 3 and verse 27. Galatians 3 and verse 27. For as many of you as have been or were baptized into, get that word, into Christ, have put on Christ. So how do, how do I get here? What's the Bible telling me? How do I get here? I'm baptized into that body. As many of us have been baptized into Christ, have put on, have put on Christ. So let me ask this question. Can I be saved out here? Can I can I be can I be can I be saved 
and then baptized into the body. No, no, it's baptism puts me in the body where the blood is, right? So, would answer, answer this question by way of just a very simple question. Is baptism necessary for salvation? It, ha it has to be. It has to be. It's, it's, the only, it's, the only act, it's the only action that the Bible ever describes as placing me in the body of Christ. Having faith in Jesus does not place me in the body of Christ. No, no Bible verse teaches that. No Bible verse teaches that my repentance puts me into the body of Christ. No passage teaches me that confession places me in the body of Christ. The only thing that is spoken of in the Scriptures in Galatians 3.27, 1 Corinthians 12.13, the only thing that puts me in the body of Christ is what? Baptism. Now, hear me very clearly. I am not exalting baptism above faith. I'm not exalting baptism above repentance. I'm not exalting baptism above confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. Because without any of those other three things, baptism is what? It's no good. It's just getting wet. You know, I could, you know, if I was big and strong like John used to be, you know, I could probably, I could probably go somewhere and snatch, I could probably go to the lake or the river somewhere and I could snatch up people and just dunk them all day long, couldn't I? Could I do that? But it wouldn't do me good, why? No repentance, uh, no faith, no repentance, no confession. See, all the elements have to be there. All the elements have to be there. Now, on the back of your sheet, we've walked through many of these ten things, but we're going to walk them very quickly. And then go to the, the lower the lower part. Number one. And I don't know which things I've left blank, so I'm just going to read them as I've got them because I don't have any blanks on my copy because I don't want to have to try to remember. There's only one head of the church, namely Jesus Christ. There is no other head of the church. No bishop, no pope, nobody. No president. Jesus is the only head of the church. And nobody sits in his place. Nobody, nobody sits as his substitute or his vicar. Number two, the body of Christ is the church. And there is only one body. There's one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4, one hope, Ephesians 4 and 5. There's one body, there's only one church, number three. The only remedy for sin is the blood of Jesus, Revelation 1 and verse 5. There is no remedy for sin other than the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus gives life to His body, number five. One must be in the body of Christ to be reconciled to God. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 2, and talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, it says that He might reconcile both of them to God in one body by the cross. In other words, the cross took care of the dividing line between Jews and Gentiles. No more Jews, no more Gentiles, only Christians. Only saved and lost. Christians or non-Christians. 
Number seven, we already noted this. One must be immersed in water in order to enter the body. By the way, that's what the word baptize means. It means immerse, to submerge. It's described in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4 as a burial. Colossians 2 and verse 12 as a burial. We are buried with Him in baptism and raised through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. Colossians 3 and verse 12. One must be immersed in water. That is scripturally baptized. Biblically baptized. To contact the blood of Jesus. Romans 6. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Number nine, one must be scripturally baptized, immersed in water, to be forgiven of sins and saved. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached the first gospel sermon. He says, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent, and every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Forgiveness. When Paul recounted his own conversion, which originally is recorded in Acts 9, but when Paul retold it for about the third time, or the, at least it was told for the third time in Scripture in Acts 22, Here's what he said he was told. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Paul described his own baptism as the time and the means by which he received the washing away of his sins. Number 10. One cannot be saved or in the body apart from immersion in water. In Acts 2, after Peter preached to them that Jesus had been crucified and was raised, ascended and exalted at the right hand of God, and they said, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you, to your children, to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call and with many other words he exhorted and testified, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And they that gladly received his word were baptized. And there were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. In the end of that chapter, that's, that's through verse 41. At the end of that chapter in Acts 2 verse 47, it says that the Lord added to them daily those who were being saved. Added. That's the key. That to me, that's kind of the key word there. How were they added in in forty one? By being baptized. How were they being added every single day? Verse forty seven. By being baptized. Now, five things. Very quickly, I want us to think about it with regard to baptism. There, are, there are five things that have to be correct. In other words, not just any baptism will work. You know, anything that's not a burial won't work, but I, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right? Number one, baptism has to be proper in its principle. That is, the right message has to be preached. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized believes what? The gospel. He who believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. Not he who believes the gospel is saved and can later be baptized. Belief in the gospel and baptism are requisite for salvation by the very words of Jesus. Number two, baptism must be proper in person. In person. Again, if we were to look at Mark 16, it says, Go and preach the gospel to every creature, he who believes and is baptized. So, Belief in the gospel is requisite to being baptized. So that would, that would necessarily eliminate children, babies. Babies can't hear the gospel. Well, I guess they could say they could hear it, but they can't understand it. They can't believe it. They can't obey it. 
People who are in any way, uh, for example, that might be uh, uh, mentally uh, incapacitated. For example, I have, I have a, a cousin that's been dear to me all of my life. She has Down syndrome. You know, she's matter of fact, I think Janice is even a little bit older than me. I think she's nearly 60 now. You know what? Just as safe as anybody could ever be. She doesn't, she doesn't have to be baptized. She doesn't even understand the concept of sin. She doesn't understand the concept of grace. Now, she might have been taught through the, through the years by rote memorization about some things, but her ability to comprehend those things is, 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 is not there. And so she's just as safe. She's just as safe as the day she was born. She doesn't need to be baptized. All right. And so they're you know, infants, people who don't have the mental capacity. Unbelievers can't be baptized. You know, there's there are a lot of records of the Roman Church uh, in the Middle Ages fighting wars and taking the people that they conquered in war and marching them to the river at the end of a spear and Christianizing them by baptizing them in the river. But that's not Bible baptism. You know, no, it's just a lot of people got wet. And, and the old saying on that case would still be true. He, you know, he convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. <laughs> you know, but, we, but when we're baptized, when we're baptized, we're changed. Our mind is changed. Our lives are changed. And so infants and unbelievers, those incapable of believing and responding to the gospel, uh, are, are not proper candidates for baptism. Number three, baptism has to be proper in its profession. In its profession. In Acts chapter 8, Philip began in, in Isaiah 53 and preached Jesus to the eunuch. There in verse 35. It says, And they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me to be baptized? What hinders me to be baptized? The Bible says he preached Jesus to him. But the eunuch's response to hearing that sermon was he wanted to be baptized. So what do we know that preaching Jesus necessarily includes? It's got to include baptism. The Bible doesn't say he preached baptism to him. The Bible doesn't say he preached plan of salvation to him. It says he preached Jesus to him. And his response is, I want to be baptized. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession. That's the confession that is made prior to scriptural baptism. If a person professes that they are already saved before baptism, that can't be Bible baptism. And many of our religious friends and neighbors require this profession. All right, And I'm going to get it pretty close, if not word for word. Do you believe that God has for Christ's sake forgiven you of all your sins? Do you believe that God has for Christ's sake forgiven you of all your sins? And a person has to answer yes before those folks will baptize them. So a person has to actually confess that they are saved before they are candidates to be baptized in some churches. But is that what the Bible teaches? No, the Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that we confess that Jesus is the Son of God and then we're baptized and then we're saved. The proper profession. Number four, the proper practice. We made mention. Baptism is a burial. The Greeks had a word for sprinkling. The Greeks had a word for pouring. and a Gre The Greeks had a word for submersion or immersion. And that word is baptism. You can't get... You can't get Baptism out of sprinkling water on an individual. You can't get baptism out of pouring water on an individual. The only way you get bapti baptism is to immerse the individual in water. So it has to be proper in its practice. And then Colossians 2 and verse 12 also teaches us this. We have to believe that God does something for us when we're baptized. We're buried with Him in baptism and raised through faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. In other words, I've got to believe that God does something for me when I'm baptized. Because God has promised to do something for me when I'm baptized. 
And so it's got to be proper in its practice. And then number five, it's finally, it's got to be proper in its purpose. That is, we've got to understand that baptism is for forgiveness, not because of. It's for the remission of sins, not because of. It's for the washing away of sins, not because of. In Acts 2.38, we're baptized for the remission of sins. And some people want to argue, well, that means because of. Like you go to jail for murder. Not to commit murder, but because you've already committed murder. That's the argument. Except Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So why did Jesus shed His blood? Did He shed His blood because people's sins were already forgiven? Or did He shed His blood so that people's sins would be forgiven? We all know the answer to that question. And the construction of those phrases is the same. So when Peter said be baptized for the remission of sins, he means unto for the purpose of receiving the remission of sins. We've noted Acts 22, 16. Why do you wait? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And I made mention of the letter C. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. We have to believe in the work of God in baptism. That's why baptism is not a work of man. It's a work of God. It's a work of faith. Now, last illustration. And I'm going I'm to I'm bring this guy back up just so that we can see him. Just to be reminded of what it is that we've been looking at, what we've been studying. In baking a cake... One does not get to go back and remix or rebake the ingredients. What do you mean by that? What I'm saying is, if I had all the ingredients for a cake, but I got the recipe wrong. For example, what if I what if I baked the egg before I tried to mix it in with the flour and the sugar? What if I baked the flour before I mixed it with? You, you, you know, the, we all understand how a recipe works. And, and the recipe has to be followed step by step. And if any step is omitted or out of order, you don't get the cake, do you? You don't get the result. And the same is for obeying the gospel. The same is for being saved. We can't take, for example, we can't take what we've learned today and make it retroactive to something that we did perhaps years ago that wasn't in the proper order. Just like when that, when that first cake was, was, was made or was not made through error, if you want to make a cake, what do you got to do? You got to go back and start over. And the Bible says, Jesus said, except you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. John 8, 24. Jesus said we have to repent of our sins if we want to, uh, to not perish. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Jesus said we have to confess Him before men. Matthew 10 and verse 32. Jesus said we have to believe the Gospel and be baptized if we want to be saved. Mark 16, 15 and 16. And to the Christian, Jesus said this, He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Now let me give you one more, just one more little thing. Because this is oftentimes a question people ask. If baptism is required for the remission of my sins, for the forgiveness of my sins, and I'm baptized, what do I do after that? Yeah. What about when I sin after that? And there's a provision that's made only for the Christian. And that is prayer. Prayer for the remission of sins or forgiveness of sins is purely a Christian blessing. In 1 John 1 and verse 9, speaking to Christians, John said this, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When Simon the sorcerer was baptized, and he was in Acts chapter 8, he sinned right after that. But what did Peter tell him to do? He said, repent and pray. Repent and pray. And so once we're Christians, once we've been baptized into Christ, baptized into the body of Christ, contacted the blood of Christ, we don't have to be baptized again when we sin because God's made a provision for us that we can repent of our sin, 
confess our sin, ask God to forgive us our sin, and the Bible says He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We sang a song. I know my name is there. I know my name is there. Do you know your name is there today? Do you have questions about whether or not your name is there today? Do you know that your name is not there today? This is an opportunity to change that. If you know that your name is not there, you need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And He'll write your name in His book. He'll write your name in the book. If you have questions about whether or not you're saved, I'll be happy to, to, to talk with you at whatever length is If you have questions, you're not sure, I'll be happy to sit down and, and talk with you to whatever extent is necessary. But if you know your name is not there, you need to make a change. For the child of God, it may be the case that you've sinned and in some way strayed from the straight and narrow way and you need the, sin, or the prayers of the church, you need to repent and ask for the prayers of the church on your behalf. If we can assist you in any way, our song is, I have decided to follow Jesus. Do not sing a lie this morning. Sing that song with 100% assurance of faith that you have decided to follow Jesus. And if you need to make some type of public uh, response, then we stand ready to assist you. As together we stand and sing this song.